This is a production of PBS Charlotte. They were the symbols of freedom and success. Alone, cars supported a family, but together, they were the collective wheels that drove a nation forward. America grew up on the automobile. For generations, the classics have drawn the car lovers and the gearheads alike. For some, it's about preserving history. Ask me about brass cars and I'm gonna smile. Driving it looks like it would be a lot of fun, but driving it's like driving a covered wagon with a steering wheel on it. For the diehards, it's transforming rare barn finds. It looks a whole lot better than the first time I saw it. Into rare treasures of American automotive history. Others think outside the box when choosing their classic rides. I like the old trucks, it's just something that not too many people have. We're hitting the road, and it's invitation only, as we go behind closed garage doors with folks who put blood. I've got scars on my hands to prove I didn't do stuff right the first time. Sweat. It's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of enjoyment. And treasure. I mean, you gotta be able to spend a few dollars into keeping classic cars, trucks, and big rigs on the road here in the Charlotte region. When industrialist Henry Ford debuted the Model T, his goal was to build an automobile for the common man. What happened was total disruption to how Americans moved around as the wheels ushered in a new era of freedom and the open road. When the automobiles started in this country, most people couldn't go anywhere except, you know, horse and wagon. America's love of cars was almost instant. It was the iconic symbol of success. It was two tons of pride and joy. You know, so many photos are posed with cars in there. Cars in the background or they're sitting on the running board or standing against the grill because people just, you know, that's been part of their life so long and so importantly that uh, they, uh, they brought the car into, into everything they were doing. So many people love cars of any kind and, and a lot of cars have been preserved for that very reason that people just didn't want to get rid of them. Twice a year, car enthusiasts come from all around the Southeast for the auto fair at Charlotte Motor Speedway. You get a chance then at a, at a national car show, especially to see a wide variety of cars. Mel Carson is executive director of the Hornet's Nest region, a chapter of the Antique Automobile Club of America. We're dedicated to the, to the uh, preservation and use of antique automobiles in the Hornet's Nest region has about uh, 500 members locally. This is where we meet. This, this is where all the camaraderie and everybody come together to relate to old times and, and reminisce about how great it was to own a vehicle like this in the 60s. Perry Dixon drove all the way from Eastern NC in his beautifully restored blue and white 1960 Chevy Impala. Well, the car had been dis completely disassembled did each piece separate. Like many car collectors, Dixon feels a connection to his car. Oh, a lot of pride because this is an era that I can relate to. These are cars that I always admired. Can't make it to the auto fair? No problem. Most weekends you can find a local cruise-in. It's unbelievable how many cruise-ins there are. What that means is people just kind of drive into a location, hang around, kick tires, and talk. And on the second Friday of each month at the Hardee's right on Highway 49 in Harrisburg, you'll find the Harrisburg Cruisers. It started off more just with the Harrisburg crowd, and the word's gotten out, and we've attracted a lot of the other car clubs, bringing in uh, cars from all around the Charlotte area. I'm with a little church car club uh, group of uh, guys from my church. We're all into old classic cars. Uh, our, our wives say we're all a bunch of nuts. Britt Calder brought his 64 Galaxy 500. I've been a car guy all my life. Bunch of car nuts who have their latest and greatest whatever they've got on their car show up, sit around a parking lot, tell a bunch of stories about the cars they have, the cars they've had, the cars they want to have, and, you know, just 
just share the car culture, really, is all it is. It's the neatest thing in the world because you get to see all these cars, you get to find out what people have done to their cars. It's the camaraderie, being able to uh, meet new people, you get to help people. Harrisburg Cruiser's treasurer, Joe Palumbo's 57 Chevy is a boyhood dream come true. I had an older brother that had an old beater 57. I was about nine years old and he taught me how to drive this thing in the driveway, barely see up over the steering wheel. And he said, here's first, here's reverse. Don't hit the house, don't hit the barn. Just gas it and hold on. You never know what might show up at a cruise in. Just a lot of a lot of really classic American iron and a uh, little bit of foreign stuff here and there. I saw McLaren roll in a little while ago, a little bit of new, a little bit of old, uh, you know, just a little bit of everything. In southwest Mecklenburg County, it's not uncommon to find Chris Sudreth and his son Josh cruising around in a pair of classic red Ford trucks. I have a 1960 F100, and I also have a 1955 F100. Uh, this, this is completely originally stocked from 1960. There's the bill of sales on the side of the window. It's basically got a 292 V8 big block. The younger said Riff knows all the details on his ride as well. It's a 55, got a 429 motor in it with a C6 uh, Cannon racing transmission in it. So uh, positive traction, and uh, just by saying that, most car guys already know it'll haul. Chris's connection to his 1960 Ford runs deep, going back over 30 years. Got it in 1985, had to borrow about $300 from my mother. It was $800 originally. She passed right before I could pay her back. He says at the time, things with his own father weren't always the best. We were at a point where um, really, uh, we really didn't have that father-son relationship. Then the truck broke down and sat for years on his father's property. Eventually, a family friend took it to New York for restoration, and more than just the truck was restored. Dad, Dad had a lot of you know, passion for the truck as well because we grew together when we were apart, and the truck after mother passed, it helped bring us together. Now, it's a passion he shares with his own son. I know before my son even had gotten his 55, he was really bonding with me on the 60. When you're 16, 17, most kids are gonna go out by themselves, go hang out with their friends. They're not gonna wanna hang out with their dad. You know, my dad's not like that. The pair spends hours prepping their rides for weekend car shows and cruisings. We do what we can do, what's over our head. You know, yes, we ask for help. It's a lot of work, but it's also a lot of enjoyment. They've even won a few awards with their trucks, but it's the father-son bonding time Chris cherishes most. It's great to see somebody that's 17, 18 years old that could be out running the wrong crowd and chooses to share these moments with me. You know, it's very emotional, um, it's very rewarding. Now and then, the duo admits a tiny bit of tension arises. It's challenging from time to time, you know. I, I think that I know most of the ways, but uh, even though I'm in auto tech in school, he's the 50-year-old he's the that knows what he's been doing since he's 16, 17 years old. In the summer of 2018, Chris's father, David Sudreth, someone who shared equal passion for these old trucks, passed away at the age of 81. Chris and Josh both agree, the 1960 Ford that's connected three generations will stay in the family. It's got more emotional attached than it has ever had before. For a truck that I've fallen in love with when I was 11, 12, my dad's always said, once, once I'm dead and gone, you can do what you want to with it not happening. Yeah, that's, that's not going nowhere. The how and why someone chooses a collector car varies from person to person. For Tom Logano, father of race car driver Joey Logano, his criteria is pretty specific. Most of the cars I got have some kind of tie emotionally, I guess, or so. I'm from Portland, Connecticut, and uh, I got a 65 Corvette, and that came from a good friend of mine that I grew up from sandbox days in Portland, Connecticut. 
I have a, a, a Ford Maverick. That was the first car, 1971 Ford Maverick, the first car I ever owned. Um, I, got, I was in the garbage business, so I have a 53 Chevy pickup truck that uh, I came kept from a, a garbage company up in Connecticut. Each one is a different person, you know? It's just got its own personality, its own quirks about it, and, and uh, you adjust to them, and, and uh, it's pretty fun. Working on them is fun. I also really enjoy driving them, you know, going out at night, you know, when it cools off and taking them through the country roads and stuff like that. I, I kind of enjoy driving them. Logano's garage is full of classic cars, but with a background in the transportation industry. I uh, love the big trucks. I always loved big trucks since I was a kid. And he has several in his collection. The 65 B model Mac behind me there. I got a, a 48 EG model Mac. I got a 53 Peterbilt um, truck that we're working on now and a 71 Peterbilt with a extended nose. So I, I like the old trucks. It's just something that not too many people have. A lot of people have the antique cars, but not too many have the big trucks. If you ever get a chance to ride in his 65 Mac with Logano behind the wheel, you're in for an experience. It's more fun than driving an antique car. It's just awesome. The, the noise, the air horns, the shifting, we have twin sticks in them, so they got quad box, they got a five speed and a four speed, and you're twin shifting. He shares his passion with his son, Joey, and says the hobby keeps them connected when life keeps them both busy. It's good for him to do something outside a race, and it takes his mind off of things, and so our, our common bond is antique vehicles, and 80% and of the time we talk, it's, it's about, hey, did you, did you see this car? Did you go in Hemmings and see that car? Did you find this truck? And with the birth of his grandson, Hudson, in 2018, Logano started a very special project, adding a bit of space to his 1953 Peterbilt. The reason, taking Hudson to McDonald's in the big rig, just like he did when Joey was a kid. When I got this Peterbilt, and I've had it for years, when I had the grandson, the first thing I did is I got on and I looked for an old bunk for an old Peterbilt and cut a big hole out in the back of the Peterbilt. And uh, my thing is I'm gonna put my son and my grandson in the back of that Peterbilt and we're gonna go to McDonald's. And that's why I'm putting a bunk on the back of a 53 Peterbilt. Now there's one more special car in the Logano garage, one you might not expect, a 1971 Buick Riviera. Well, that's not a stock Riviera, that's a supercharged Riviera. For Tom Logano, the cars and trucks are a blast, but it all comes back to family. It does connect generations. The, the antique cars, it, it's a passion that we all can share, you know, and hopefully Hudson takes it on. If he does, it, it'd be great. In Rock Hill, South Carolina, Ed Longino is out for a cruise. We're in a 1930 Ford Model A two-door. These things are geared real low, so you get going in first, just barely moving, and then you should shift into second at about six miles an hour. On this day, he's in Rock Hill to meet up with other members of the Queen City Model A Club. Being around these other guys, you know, the camaraderie side of it is, is special. Um, you know, learning about the history of Model A's is uh, very interesting and about uh, Henry Ford. Here in Jim Townsend's garage, We've got the lift and we've got plenty of room to bring cars in. We've got good work matches to work on. Club members gather for a shop time event. Townsend created these events to help spread knowledge and keep these cars on the road. There was people in the club, young people in the club didn't know how to maintain their cars. And it's, it's like a tutorial. Every one of us has something to contribute. Uh, for those guys that have done this before, they're helpful. They can tell you what you need to look for and what to expect. Dave says, my heart, car was hard was to catch on that trip. I said, you know, mine was too. And then Danny comes up and says, my car was hard. It was hot, the oil was thin. Today, they're working on Danny Phillips's 1929 Ford Model A Phaeton. Let the tape come down on the bumper. Front end has a shimmy in it. Now that, that tip will slip, you know. And we're trying to take the shimmy out. If you go across a railroad track or hit a little pothole in the road, the front wheels would start to wobble. And so we've taken his whole front end apart. It's fairly easy to work on. It's not complicated. We're not having to replace any parts yet. We adjusted the toe end. We greased his wheel bearings and tightened them a little bit. He had a little bit of play in his wheel bearings. But everything else checked out real good. The car's in good shape and safe to drive. The shop time events are more than instructional. It's a social event. There's a lot of watching going on, but then there's side discussions on the side, and there's no wear on that. You don't have any in play. 
anything we do brings a question, well, you know, my car does such and such, what do you think about that? And so we share stories and share, share information that way. Go beyond the importance of it of sharing knowledge on how to work on them. Uh, we like to drive them. I love the sound of them. If you've ever heard the exhaust sound of a Model A, it's different from anything else. And with the Queen City Model A Club shop time events, it's a sound folks will continue to hear for a long time to come. With all the room in his garage, Townsend rents out parking places to other car enthusiasts. One of those cars is co-owned by Walter Anderson Hardin and his cousin. Uh, this car that I've got my hand on, my father and my uncle bought in 1950 from the original owner. And it's a 1923 Anderson car. It was manufactured right here in Rock Hill, South Carolina. Hardin's great-grandfather owned the very successful Rock Hill Buggy Company. But as demand for buggies dwindled and the demand for automobiles surged, John Gary Anderson started building cars. They manufactured their first car in 1916. By the 1920s, an Anderson car would set you back about $2,400. That's about $36,000 today. Basically what Anderson made was the coach work. He bought his uh, frame rails from a stamping plant, his fenders from a stamping plant, his radiator shrouds from a stamping plant, his engines from Continental, his transmissions from Durston, and he assembled them here. And what he built was the wood frame bodies with the metal panels on them and the, the upholstery. After about 10 years of production and plagued with cash flow issues, the Anderson Motor Company declared bankruptcy. Hardin's 1923 Anderson is extremely rare. Somewhere around 5,000 cars were built by Anderson. Only a dozen remain, and even fewer are drivable. It's, uh, it's quite a piece of equipment, and uh, it's driving it looks like it would be a lot of fun, but driving it's like driving a covered wagon with a steering wheel on it. It's, it's rattling and rolling and very slow. But in terms of the Southeast, this was the only real successful car. There might have been some others, but this is the only one that really built a successful automobile. And he was selling these all over the world, too. If you ever get your hands on a classic car and enjoy wrenching on them, eventually you're likely going to need a little help. After years in the textile industry working as an engineer, Ken Wright retired and now has more time to work on his old cars. I don't play golf, I don't fish, I don't hunt, so I just work on cars. Several years ago, he restored this 1950 Mercury Coupe. It's a near-perfect, award-winning restoration. We have to pull this down. But it's a different car on this day that has his attention, yeah. a 1967 Camaro RS convertible. I've had this car since 1985. My daughter wanted a convertible, so I found this one and, and, and got it, bought it. and. Uh, did a little work on it, and we am going to replace the, the battery tray. And before I knew it, I had the whole car apart. For more than 30 years, this iconic American muscle car sat in pieces. Now he's determined to get it back on the road. With the help from family and his friend Jerry Wooten, today's the day the engine goes back in. And Wright says having good help makes all the difference. It's real important because no one person knows everything. Some, some people may, but uh, I don't, so I like to have people that I can get help from to help me do things that I, I don't know how to do, and in return, maybe I can help them do something that they don't know how to do. Friends like fellow car lover and 32 Ford owner, Jerry Wooten. Ken and I actually have known each other for about eight years, and really started at a car show and you meet someone, you start talking, you find out that they, they have a passion for the same thing that you do. The Camaro that Ken's building is really a pretty well stock car. It's made to be a real driver, one that you could get in and go cross country if you like. Wright's still got a long list to tick off before that happens. And this is a, uh, a 396 cubic inch engine with a Muncie four speed. Uh, it's not being a high-tech car, a car being built basically the way it was made in 1967. It'll do the speed limit and beyond, but not going to drive it very fast. And when it's done, 30 plus years later, Wright is on the record. His daughter will eventually get the car. Well, 
that's in the plans. I'm gonna drive it and try it out a while and then turn it over to her, I guess. In rural York County, South Carolina, Bill McCleave is driving a very rare car, a car he saved from a barn. I have a 1910 REO, a Rio. It's delightful, uh, just delightful. It's like uh, driving history. It, you know, when you're in a 108 year old car, it's pretty thrilling to, to think about not only the performance of the car, but also how our ancestors got around. This car is about uh, 16 or 18 horsepower, depending on the gasoline and the air fuel mixture. But it will go down the road uh, about 35 miles an hour on a flat up a hill. It slug, slugs down a little bit. REO stands for Ransom Eli Olds, the founder of the REO Motor Company. When looking at this century old car, it's hard to imagine it once looked like this, fresh out of a Tennessee barn. When I got it, it looked like a used farm implement. Most of the body had been eaten up by termites. It looks a whole lot better than the first time I saw it. So uh, uh, it came in on a trailer with a net over it to keep all the parts on the trailer. Lifelong friend Andy Kloniger spent countless hours working with McCleave during this multi-year restoration. I did a lot of work on the frame and, you know, just trying to figure out what holes to patch and what to leave open and that kind of stuff. McCleave hired a Pennsylvania craftsman to reconstruct the car's mostly wood body, but what defines the car? The Brass Era car is a car typically that was made in 1915 or before most, in fact, of the Brass Era cars were 1911 and before. It was a carryover from the buggies. Brass was easy to form, and uh, the buggy makers for the 100 years before this had figured out how to make almost anything out of brass. McCleave also owns what he believes is the last 1927 REO Speedwagon Junior delivery truck. It took four or five years with the help of Cloninger to restore this classic, but why do it? It's just a joy of doing it, I think, and, and keeping, keeping this kind of history alive. Back at the auto fair, members of the AACA Hornet's Nest region run a unique program that exposes area Boy Scouts, like 15-year-old Zach Ofsanek, to auto mechanics. Uh, I'm here for the Automotive Maintenance Merit Badge. Uh, it's supposed to help us figure out how to tinker with cars, how they work, what makes them tick. We've been doing the scout program now for 10 years, and during that time, um, by our estimate, we've served over a thousand scouts in the Carolina region. Um, we've had some come as far away as Maryland to participate in our program here. And it's basic material on how to check oil, how an engine works, check your tire pressure, things like that. It's just one of the ways the 500 plus member group gives back to the community while sharing its love of classic cars. They may never be antique automobile enthusiasts and we're not trying to necessarily go there, but we just are trying to help all we can with their overall education. Volunteers take the scouts around several different makes and models of cars, giving them a chance to point out components. I hope they have fun while we're out here teaching them the merit badge, and I really hope uh, that they walk away having learned just a little bit of basic automotive knowledge, even if it's just how to check pressure in a tire. And in the process, they may just inspire the next generation of car nuts and gearheads. Zach already has his favorite. Uh, the 1940s Mercury, uh, because it just looks really cool. As the years pass, what's considered a classic car will continue to change. Believe it or not, if you own a 1993 minivan, you can join the Antique Automobile Club of America. Mel Carson says it just has to be 25 years old to qualify. He adds, there's, there's something for everybody who has any interest in the automobile, you know, and, and it, yes, it does come down to some money. I mean, you gotta be able to spend a few dollars, uh, but you can do it relatively inexpensively. The automobile continues to define the nation. As much as these wheels carried us forward, these classic treasures roll us back Decades disappear behind the wheel, and these cars and trucks transport us. The automotive landscape is changing, but there's a timelessness to the classics that will endure.
a production of PBS Charlotte.